Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. And today we're going to ask how can we, that's to be defined, get our mojo, that's also to be defined, back. How can we get our mojo back? And the tagline for this is apathy is the worst policy of all. For this discussion, we have co host Tim Apicella and special esteemed guest Gene Rosenfeld. Welcome to the show, you guys. Good morning. Morning. So uh, let, let's go to you first, Tim, because we do have to define our terms. For this discussion, and, and by the way, Gene may not agree, uh, who is we? Who is we when we ask the question, how can we get our mojo? Well, I would say it's uh, fellow Americans is the we. Um, and then as far as mojo, I mean, uh, well, let's go back to we. Um, it's our citizenship. It's our it's our residence, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a citizen of the United States. Um, you know, it could be people that live in a community together. It could be the cities, the you know, the rural parts of America. It's all people that live within the confines of our border. That's the we. You know, I, mean, I think the, the term we is actually uh, uh, implies that. We are, we are together. It's a together term. It's we are um, arguably of one voice and of one faith. Uh, by the way, uh, Jean designed this question. So I'm going to ask her <laughs> if she agrees with you. And if she does, to what percentage does she agree with what you've said? Well, I wasn't done. <laughs> <laughs> now that I know I'm going to be tested, I'm going to expand. All right. No, all right, no, watch let, out. no, no, Gene, by all means, let it fly. Go ahead. <laughs> I would never issue a test to you, Tim. <laughs> oh, you should. <laughs> you find it beautifully, I think. And uh, we is a word that Americans are becoming increasingly um, unhappy about because um, there is a sense that we are divided. I think we would all agree to that. It's, it's very uncomfortable. And it, it lets fly all kinds of emotions. And so the one emotion that we entails is uh, togetherness. Uh, this feeling of being in a community, a, a very large community that is tolerant of differences, but knows that we have each other's back. Uh, and let me get your thoughts about Mojo. Uh, you said you agree with Tim, but uh, would you add to that? Mojo, spirit, energy, um, can do this in terms in American terms. We're the people who can do. Give us a challenge, we'll meet the challenge every time. Yeah, I got I, I remember those days, but it seemed like years ago. And and part of this discussion is about apathy, a, apathy, a complacency, and all that. You know, we've been talking about those words on Think Tech for a long, long time. Uh, can you help us with what apathy means in this context? And what complacency means? Well, apathy is when you stand aside when something important is happening that you know about or is in front of you. And you don't, you don't take steps to intervene and somehow deflect it or improve it. And it's the default mechanism that almost everybody uses when they're troubled, when they see some troubles them, that it would take too much mojo <laughs> to get involved in it. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, experiments confirm that uh, when bad things happen and when regimes turn violent, most individuals are apathetic. They don't involve themselves, even when they feel strongly inside of themselves that they should, that things are going in the wrong direction. They seek to avoid, uh, to be passive, uh, to think somebody else will do it, not me. And there are ways to overcome that that, are, that we should all know. But especially when things get worse and worse, 
the tendency is to find a place to hide. Yeah, well, you know, we, we talked um, a number of times uh, about um, what happens when you don't like either of the candidates for president. You know, for one reason or another, you're down on Trump and Biden, both of them. So, um, you know, you make yourself an uncommitted, uh, you make yourself a, you know, a, um, independent. Um, but uh, I think, Tim, that that's really what we're talking about. Um, you decide to get off in the sidelines. You decide that you want to have apathy because it, 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 it suits you best, that you don't have to commit. You don't want to commit. You don't like the options. Uh, and what, what are your thoughts about that? And, and is that happening? Uh, to some degree, yes. But um, let's, you know, let's take a little walk back in the last seven years and how many Americans have become what I would call fatigued. Uh, there's the Trump fatigue syndrome. Um, there's the politics uh, fatigue syndrome. There is I've had enough of the news fatigue. Uh, it's the same it's the same story over and over each and every day, and it seems never to be resolved. So I think fatigue is a big part of apathy. Um, but two is uh, look at some politics. Look at look at the Michigan, uh, the Michigan primary for the Democrats. Um, rather than stay home and not vote, uh, eighteen percent of the vote. Uh, I think Biden got eighty one eighty one percent. Uh, of that of that primary, but 18% showed up to say, I'm non-committed. They got out of their barca launder, they got in their car, they went to the polling booth, and they said, non-committed. And then they went back home. So that tells me that um, there is um, apathy, but then there's there's people that, who are engaged that took the time to register a protest vote. You know, if, if you're apathetic, it means that you're not actually looking into the future. You're saying the future doesn't affect me. Uh, I can afford to go on the sidelines and be a wallflower, um, you know, because um, I, I don't. I don't think I will have any influence on this. I'm reminded of a. I took a trip to China one time, and I talked to our tour guide, Beijing, and I said, "Do you vote?" And she said, "No." I said, why don't you vote? You have a right to vote. Why don't you vote? She said, because in China, you vote for the next tier, and they vote for the tier on top of that, and they vote for the tier on top of that. And before it gets to the uh, Politburo, I mean, it, your vote has no effect at all. Zero. So when I concluded, she said that my vote had no effect, I stopped voting if she ever started. So I think uh, what happens is that people do not have the sense their vote will count, that somebody else will intervene, Gene, and do it right or wrong, and they are irrelevant to the process. Is that happening, do you think, from a point of view of social psychology, anybody? In social psychology, the experience I've been studying, Milgram and Zimbardo, both came to the same conclusion, although they were studying in slightly different ways. And what they both came up with is a theoretical hierarchy of authority that everyone lives within. If you don't have a boss immediately standing by your side telling you what to do, you're part of a system where a peer group has a unified view of what's going on. And we, we see this when people go to their favorite media, and uh, it's the same story over and over again. Uh, we may be in different silos, but we do have peer groups, and the peer groups are very homogeneous. So uh, we tend to feel that our autonomy, as this young woman you spoke to in China, our autonomy uh, has, no, has no validity, has no uh, power. Uh, we cede our power to the authority structure, whether it's hierarchical or whether it's part of a system and a situation. Um, neither uh, of these social psychologists blame the individual, the commonplace individual, the normal, quote, individual. Uh, they find that all of us who are normal and commonplace tend to have the same re reactions as a majority. There are a minority of people who will intervene, um, who will uh, buck the system. And uh, 
these are the people that need Confederates. They need others to join them. They can't do it by themselves. So resistance, as usual, is more difficult than compliance, but compliance is the default mode for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, Tim, what, uh, do people understand that uh, if they don't vote or if they vote, you know, the wrong way, like somebody who wants to be an autocrat, it will affect them? Um, and if not, why not? Because uh, clearly it will affect them. Don't you think? Oh, what a great question. This reminds me of many conversations I've had with several different people in my life that says, look, I don't get involved with politics. I avoid politics like the plague. Not realizing that everything they do in life is a result of politics, uh, be it school policies, be it taxation policies, be it health care, what health care they get or don't get out of their, you know, their insurance package, all has influence in politics and how um, some government agency or body has uh, decided how things are going to be defined. So um, I think there's a naivete of, of what politics are and the influence of politics in their lives. And I think it's wishful thinking, but it's just that, wishful thinking. You know, is it, is it the same way on both sides of the divide? I mean, for example, if I'm a, a Democrat, I may have a different view of this than a Republican. Uh, you know, I feel the Republicans these days are well organized. You can see that happening in, in these state efforts to suppress voting and so forth. Um, and you can see that you know the Democrats are kind of fragmented, and they really don't they don't get together as a as a we, if you will. Um, do you agree? Um, do you think that uh, one side of this equation is is uh, potentially more apathetic than the other side? Yeah, I do. I've always said that uh, Democrats need a spine and, and learn how to stand on their own two hind feet. Um, you had you and I have had that discussion multiple times on this program, and um, the Republicans seem to be able to uh, find those talking points, those bullet points, and stand firm on them. They don't get distracted. They don't go out in twenty different directions. Uh, they seem to be very, very good at that. Now, I will say that um, Democrats will come together rather quickly when there's a lightning a lightning rod of an issue. And I, I can think of no better one of recent is the Arizona the Arizona decision on abortion that uh, harkens back to 1864. I, I think this is a lightning rod, uh, a moment in for Democrats to rally behind. And I think they're going to. Mm, God, you just, you mentioned 1864. And yes, that's the, the year that, that that law was passed. Uh, it was in the middle of the Civil War. I don't. I don't know what light that casts on it, but th that's a significant, a significant connection. Gene, I want to talk some more about um, we, and I want to talk some more, um, you know, about um, about Mojo, and I would like to. I would like to ask you to apply them to the Congress, uh, because the Congress is a, is a, is one of the major expressions of we and Mojo to the country and the world. How is Mojo doing in Congress these days? Not well. Uh, it started 20, 25 years ago uh, when our representative in Southern California, Anthony B. Linson, who was very, very much in touch with his constituents, he happened to be a Democrat, but he could have been a Republican, um, said he wasn't he was going to resign from Congress because um, the decorum had gone out the window. And this was maybe 30 years ago. So it's been on a downward course for a long time. And now we have a Congress in which apparently something like 21 members are deeply thinking whether or not they want to remain in Congress. The, the times in which Congress becomes very, very um, dispirited and loses its mojo uh, are worrisome times. You think of before the Civil War, the great debates over slavery and the extension of slavery as we were expanding ourselves and becoming a larger nation, a nation with more potential uh, than ever um, and more territory, um, more free land for people who were poor. Um, 
at that particular time, we were also undergoing a, a, a spiral of um, pessimism about slavery and anger was was driving everyone's emotions up. And uh, Congress was very divided. Have we reached that point yet? No, we haven't. We're far from that. Uh, there have been other times as well. After World War I, we retreated into isolationism. Uh, we did not um, ratify the Treaty of Versailles, the treaty that ended World War I. Uh, and again, we tended over time uh, and with, <laughs> unfortunately, the goad of a Great Depression to become divided once more. So the natural state of politics in a free society is division, but it's the intensity of the division that counts. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's no more true uh, than with the Supreme Court, Tim. You know, uh, uh, just retired Justice uh, Breyer recently quoted as he remembers a time when the judges on the Supreme Court were friendly with each other. But that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. And uh, Gene's point about the divide um, certainly applies to this, the Supreme Court. There's a very stark divide in the Supreme Court, and it is all political. Your thoughts about the mojo of the Supreme Court, because that counts to the country, to policy, and as a definition of uh, how we are and who we are. Well, the mojo of the Supreme Court has been severely tarnished of recent as has been for decades now the mojo of Congress, and that is the influence of money, um, the influence of lobbyists, campaign um, donations, and dark money through uh, Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision. Uh, the Supreme Court is clearly not acting as a disinterested body. They are, they are biased, and um, that has been one of the biggest, largest disappointments I've seen in the last 10 years on just how, how political they align themselves. I saw an exception with uh, John Roberts and the, um, the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, where it appeared that the Affordable Care Act was going to be uh, struck from the books, demolished, and through John Roberts' vote, um, it survived. That was an exception and not the rule. So let me uh, move to other uh, elements of our democratic institutions. Let me move to the administrations involved. Um, you know, so we have one and then the other, and who knows what will happen the next time around. There are those that feel that Trump will be the, the president. Um, and, the, you know, the system calls for a vote every four years and a succession. Um, but, um, you know, it seems to me that uh, the executive branch has lost its mojo too, Gene. Uh, it's, and it's not only. The fact that one side, in this case, the Republicans, try to block everything that, that Biden wants to do, it's that the, uh, the bureaucracy is not really with him, that he, he can't necessarily control it. A lot of it is legacy from Trump appointees and so forth. And, and if Trump wins next time, um, you know, the administration, the, leg, the, um, the people in the departments will all be his appointees, uh, like it or not. And that's different. So query, does does the leader of the country, the president, have the same mojo that we used to think he had, or she, uh, and the administration under him, does that have the same mojo that we used to think it had? There has always been a tension in the American political system and the executive branch over how just how much power the executive should have uh, on his side uh, to do or command uh, anything. And that started with the Federalist Papers when they were discussing what kind of president to have, and it continues to the present day. Perhaps the greatest limitation on the presidency that's been enacted um, in the last 100 years was the passage of the amendment to limit the president to two terms. That was largely because the great fear of a strong executive, ironically, has been a Republican view. And they were very concerned when FDR 
uh, was elected so many times, and they wanted to stop that. By the same token, uh, ironically, that, that may be one of the things that will prevent abuse should Donald Trump get into power. We know from the way he acted the first time and the time he's had to consolidate um, his support in between in terms of having an actual plan for revising the civil service. Uh, it's called Project 25. It's developed by the Heritage Foundation. He will put it in place. He will replace individuals who are not on board with him with his own desired uh, personnel, and he will have the right to fire these people. Now, there was no real civil service when George Washington was president, but we didn't really need one then. Uh, times have changed. Uh, they, the society has changed. It's hard to be an originalist, I think, when, um, do you want to go back to the society of uh, 1789? I, I don't think so. So we have to keep pace with a very complex society that now, in essence, leads the world. And if we lose our mojo, uh, the world will lose something very important also. We need to get into that. But the fight over the power of the presidency uh, will, I think, reach a very high point uh, should uh, Donald Trump be reelected. And let's get into that. I think that's a, a really um, an important point to discuss here today. Um, what about that? If we lose our mojo, I mean, uh, um, I remember people on our shows, you know, have said that other countries um, who see that we are not powerful, uh, they, they take opportunities against us. Um, and I think that's proving out in so many ways. But um, what about that? If Because losing your mojo is a public spectacular. Everyone can see it. That's part of the definition implicitly. So what if we lose, when we lose, if we are losing our mojo today, how is that affecting our position as the city on the hill? Well, <laughs> kind of turns out the lights uh, for our allies and those who depend on us. And uh, they're already making moves. They're, they're already thinking about uh, plan B and how they would get through it uh, and deal with it. Uh, some things uh, are truly at great risk, things that maybe most voters don't even know about. And uh, apathy, of course, uh, might be the deciding factor in this election. Yeah, oh, I totally agree. You know, Tim, one, one thing that we really haven't covered is the checks and balances aspect of the government. So, you know, we've talked about the executive um, and the civil service. We've talked about the Supreme Court. We've talked about Congress, so forth. But we haven't talked about checks and balances because that was part of the architecture that the founders came up with. And maybe it was one of the most important parts um, of the architecture, that one branch, you know, could not do it all by itself, that there had to be a and ability of another branch uh, to weigh in on things. Uh, how are we doing in terms of the mojo of checks and balances these days? Um, what was intended uh, by our, our, the authors of our constitution and how government operates has been, like all things over time, changed, bastardized. And I'm specifically thinking of the filibuster rule, how uh, what was a simple protest Bef you know, before someone was run over by the dominant party, they had an opportunity to voice their 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 opinion and and their their um, dissension from a particular vote or position or policy, and that's been that's been altered to a point where it's created nothing but gridlock in in Congress, and I, I think um, the mojo is being stopped because of some arcane rule that was never intended to be in the first place. Well, you know, uh, this all brings to my mind um, Article 5, because now we're in that part of our discussion today where we ask the, the question is, uh, how can we get our mojo back? We, you know, and for the next six hours, I hope you don't mind taking a stand. You know, <laughs> Seven. Staying around. <laughs> we should try to discuss that. 
But now the Republicans have an initiative going on all over the country, Gene, under Article 5, which is essentially a constitutional convention in order to rewrite the Constitution in order to fix, they say, what's wrong with it, and presumably to get our mojo back. What do you think of the Republican initiative to implement Article 5? Well, if uh, they don't want to go back to 1789 and have a society such as that with limited government, um, which is what they've been for for many years, and they're suddenly reversing it and they want to rewrite the Constitution, uh, you can only imagine that a party which is governed by Donald Trump, how they would want to rewrite the Constitution. And that would mean regime change in the United States. And regime change would not be democratic change. It would be anti-democratic change. Uh, as to what they want and what they can get, that's two different things. Uh, a constitutional convention at this point in our society would be very um, destabilizing. Um, and it could go on for a long time. I mean, we have enough trouble trying to get a budget passed and kicking the can down the road, we can't afford to come apart at the seams as a society in the midst of the global challenges we face today. I certainly agree. Uh, Tim, talking about kicking things, uh, let's kick around some ideas for how we can answer that question. How can we get our mojo back? And forget for this discussion, Article 5. Oh. What can we do within the existing framework, within the existing structure, to get our mojo back for Congress, for the Supreme Court, for the administration, whoever it is, um, and, and for the bureaucracy? How can we get those branches of government mm, working again? Well, I think we have to go back to, to the basics, and that is, um, you know, you no one party gets to claim victory on all things. Uh, there's something called consensus building. There's something called um, making um, compromises as you're constructing laws and drafting laws that no one, no one politician, no one party gets to take a winner takes all kind of attitude. And that's kind of where we're at. It's a complete polarization of, of what each team wants. And the fact that um, it's perceived as a sin to go out to lunch with your Republican or your Democratic fellow congressman, uh, and then you are then ostracized because you are seen talking to someone in a friendly manner. Um, that's how you start is the relationship building back again in Congress. And then you can work on the hard things that, that destroy our mojo. And uh, just a couple items that comes to play that you don't need Article 5 with would be uh, a, a, an agreement, a cooperation, 60 votes in the Senate, a majority in the House that says, uh, let's look at term limits. Or let's go back to where we got close to is look at campaign financing and stop the dark money and, and, and work on something that overturns Citizens United or curtails, severely curtails the influence of lobbyist dollars on, on politicians and their need to get reelected and they need the money to stay in their jobs and let's look at those simple things. Well, they're not simple. They're, they're complex and hard. But um, things that can be corrected now, if there was a, a cooperation, a will to, to address those tough, hard issues. But that will never take place until you have uh, a realignment of relationships uh, between Democrats, independents, and Republicans. Yeah, it, remind, it reminds me when I practiced, they would say, what, what is real estate law all about? And the answer was, it's not about real estate, not about land. It's about relationships. Everything, you know, the human experience is about relation. We are a social animal. So, I mean, I take your point. And Stephen Breyer, you know, from the Supreme Court, would take your point, too. He would say, uh, <clears throat> let's build better relationships. Let's be respectful of each other. That's job number one. Um, and maybe if you have that, you have a new, you know, a new fundamental arrangement, social arrangement, that can solve other problems. But uh, how do you achieve that, Tim? Sorry I asked you that question. That's a really hard one. No, how, it's how easy. Can you, 
Yeah, it's easy. Ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, but when you rub shoulders with your, you know, someone's at a social function, be it dinners, lunches, um, events, and, and you get to know who your fellow senator is from across the aisle, and you understand what their family's like, what they're like, where they're from. Uh, these common things called humanity and an exchange of information and values and attitudes and commonalities. Uh, it's, it's no different than, uh, you know, kids going to school and getting to meet their new classmates and becoming lifetime friends, lifelong friends. Um, it's simple. Technology is isolating us. Email, text, um, all these ways of enhanced communication that aren't so enhanced. Sometimes it's an old-fashioned, you know, eye-to-eye, -eye, meet and greet, and maybe have a cocktail or two over that meet and greet. Who knows? But um, we're missing something, and it's, it's unfortunate because as Congress becomes more isolated from one another as far as members, um, so goes our ability to make laws that benefit the American public. Hmm. You remind me of uh, Alexander Baldwin here in Hawaii. There's a CEO there by the name of Bobby Pfeiffer, and uh, he was a great executive. And one of the marks of his executive uh, you know, performance was that he knew the names of all the wives of the employees and spouses of the employees of A and B. And he knew the names of all the children. He knew all these people. There were a lot of them. And he knew the names of the pets, their animals. He knew everything about them. And so he could really be socially connected that way. And, you know, it's, of course, he was also a good executive in other contexts. But the <clears throat> fact is he was very successful because he had that social connection with all the people who worked with, with Well, him. Jay, I, I know I couldn't remind you of him because when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't even know who I am. <laughs> Too many cocktails the night before, you know? Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Gene, I want to go in another, another direction with you. You know, it seems to me that over the course of American history, we have made the chief executive more powerful. It's just the way it works. <clears throat> you know, you don't have to have Congress to start a war. <laughs> Congress would do a lot of executive order things, and, and, and the tension is always pushing, you know, at that, at, that, at that boundary, that edge. And so our chief executives have gotten more powerful. But are they powerful enough? A, should we rein them in? And maybe that will help in terms of balance of power. Or B, should we make them more powerful? Uh, should we make them unstoppable as to their own initiatives? Uh, is that a solution, either one way or the other? Well, the devil's in the details. <laughs> Number one, who's the chief executive and what are his, in this case, his objectives? Um, there are times when you want a more powerful executive in wartime, obviously, uh, in time when you're um, uncertain as to what the future will be. And um, there are times you want an executive who fades into the background and you don't, you don't want somebody to, uh, to be, a, you know, you want Congress to take the lead. I think basically what the executive is there to do is to make sure that if Congress doesn't do its job, that they will step in and have both the power, the confidence, and the ability to make a decision that will move things forward uh, in an urgent context. Uh, powers uh, of a state of emergency belong to the executive, only to that branch for a reason. That's when you need a powerful executive. But you need a constitution that will make sure that declaring a state of emergency is very much a last resort and happens very, very infrequently. Yes, mm -hmm. the bully pulpit. A, 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 a president should be able to use that bully pulpit to go to the people, persuade them, cajole them, unite them. Um, that's a very special trait and why we tend to elect people that we feel have this power to compel us to see their point of view. That's called charisma. 
But if you're overly charismatic, you also become a threat because uh, the president should be able to hear all sides and then come to some kind of a resolution or recommendation that people find uh, has common sense. And uh, even if it's unpopular, it's not something it's uncomfortable, they're willing to unite and do. It's hard to be president these days. Everything you do will be uh, criticized by people who don't agree for some reason. Um, and there are so many issues on the desk of any president at any moment. You know, you wonder how any human being can do it. And then put on top of that the need to relate to the public and the electorate and to run for office every four years. This is not easy, and, and it's, it's hard to focus, I would say. Now, on certain, on certain cruise ships, in fact, on all cruise ships, you have two captains. You have one captain that's responsible for navigating the ship and making sure, you know, the powertrain works and all that. And you have another captain that goes to the dining room and sits with other, with people who are guests on the ship. And he's the social, or she's the social captain. Uh, why can't we divide that up? Why, why is the vice president so powerless? Uh, vice president has, has been, you know, has been relegated. Uh, why can't we have two captains with d designated jobs? Have we missed the boat? On, that's not a pun. Have we missed the boat on that? <laughs> well, the president has a team. We forget that it's really the team that runs the country. The president's like the CEO. And uh, the vice president is a member of that team. Depending on the CEO, the vice president will have more or less power. The vice president has as much visibility, presence, and power as the president deigns to give her or him. So depending on why the vice president is there, whether it was just political reasons to get elected or uh, the fact that this person knows a lot and can be depended upon, um, the most important thing about the vice president is that he or she be kept in the loop uh, like Harry Truman was not. Uh, so that they are ready to take over in the moment they're needed, which could be any moment. Yeah. And we don't have any uh, way of knowing whether that is actually taking place. The other reason for making the vice president more visible is in a second term when the president feels that this is the person who should lead the country in the next administration. We have all these culture points, like relegating the vice president to you know the back room. Um, we can fix those culture points. One president could be elected, and he would be able to, or she would be able to fix those points and and change, you know, the paradigm. Um, seems, and that would not require Article Five or even legislation. It would it would be a culture point, and somebody, a good leader, would, you know, the, the magic of good leadership with Bobby Pfeiffer, for example, was delegation, and you delegate properly, and you follow up, and all that. I mean, the corporate world, I wouldn't say it's full of good leaders, but it has its fair share of good leaders. Um, is our leadership culture behind the, the eight ball here? Do, have we lost our mojo on the way it works in the White House? Tim, you're shaking your head. Oh, I love this one. Um, well, first off, before I tackle this one, I have an exception to the last um, question that you asked, Jane. That was... Why does the vice president have no power? Well, ask that to Dick Cheney and you won't get the same answer. <laughs> now, uh, as we lost our mojo in the White House as far as leadership, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to stand on my little, my little wooden soapbox here for one minute. And that is, when we select a leader, we, we have some expectations. And those expectations are, is one, <laughs> they're rational. Two, they're in good health. Uh, we, we think they're going to, you know, ha have enough good health to get through their term. And if not, then it goes to the vice presidency. I I'm looking for that day when we look at health, not only as physical health, but also mental health. We've got to start stop hiring wannabe dictators that have serious personality uh, flaws, uh, either of psych psycho psychopathic problems, uh, their so sociopaths. Uh, supreme and extreme narcissists, and we've got to start looking at those qualities 
before they even become the party's final candidate. And until we do that, um, the world's been plagued by dictators that all have the same characteristics. Let's stop hiring and electing dictators that have serious personality flaws. You want your mojo back? Get some sane people that have character and integrity, not psychopathy. Yeah. And for some of them, you have to send them to uh, Poli Sci 101 so they can learn well, that about too. Yeah, that's another, that's a whole other uh, discussion. <laughs> and maybe History 101 too, Gene. So I have to ask you. How about you my Humanity job. 101? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's social psychology, I think. So, um, so query. Uh, my this is my penultimate question to you, and I'll start with you, Tim. Um, you know, what's what's the Charles Dickens side of this? What's what's the um, the ghost of Christmas future? Uh, if we do nothing, if we here admit that you know we have lost our mojo, um, and if we admit or agree that there's not too much we can actually do, that we don't have the six hours together. To, actually come up with a plan. If you want to stick around, it's okay. Um, you know, what happens? What happens in the in the ghost of Christmas future? The Decanian Dickens Dick the Dickensian <laughs> ghost of Christmas future. Well what remember happens? how that ended. Remember how that was resolved. And as Scrooge was on the his grave in the snow, he said, are these the things that will be or maybe, so destiny was not set in concrete yet. And it goes back to our earlier discussion about apathy. Will the Americans allow things to happen because they're, they're not engaged any longer, they're burned out, or for whatever reason, they're apathetic? Then they will become the things that will be. But if they get involved, if they get engaged, maybe these things that we predict may be, but maybe not be. Got it. Um, Gene, let me, let me turn to you and say, is it going to be fine? Is it going to be swell? Is, does the American system, the Constitution, the American dream, as it has been realized here in recent years, uh, have the resilience to carry on no matter what? Should I not worry about it? Should I just stop worrying? It'll be fine? What do you think? I think we should be very worried. I think we are facing uh, a reversal of anything that uh, science, social science could have predicted. We had a, a charismatic leader who unleashed some of the demons in our society, racism for one, uh, lack of decorum for another, uh, which is very serious because when the laws no longer apply, it's the norms and mores and ethics of uh, the whole collective that do apply. Uh, division, polarization, targeting, uh, coercion, calls for violence. Uh, these generally uh, belong to a, a bad charismatic leader, a malevolent charismatic leader, which Trump has shown himself to be. And his, the threat level is very high. However, he, he's lost every election Basically, even the first one, he was not elected by a majority, as most Republican presidents have not been in the recent years. And um, so he lost that. He didn't build the wall. He, he lost the 2022 election. So he should be finished as a charismatic leader. A charismatic leader has to be a miracle man. He's, all of his promises have to come true. His rivals cannot win over him. But right now, he's acting like a co-president. He is manipulating the Speaker of the House. He is getting more press than anybody else. He is, we are told, highest in the polls. And uh, voters are beginning to change their ideas according to the propaganda that he, as an authority, is putting forth, which is right in line with social psychology experiments. And the rest of us are getting progressively apathetic. So, yes, we should be very worried. Okay, Tim. Uh, let me let me make you the the last speaker here. Um, um, how much of what Gene said do you agree with on a percentage basis? One hundred and five percent. Okay. Now explain the five percent. Her words could not be truer at any time. 
past, present, or future. All right. And on that note, thank you very much, co-host Tim Apicella, esteemed guest Gene Rosenfeld, for a very, a very thoughtful discussion. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.